and welcome back to the What The Fork podcast. Today's guest is responsible for one of the loudest roars that I've possibly ever heard at a stadium and a man who's gone down in folklore at Celtic Park, Coke Bridge's finest, Tony Watt. How are you doing, Tony? You all right? I'm good, mate. How are you? Uh, same as everyone, struggling. It's weird times, isn't it? What have you been up to during lockdown? Uh, it's strange times. It's I've been okay. I'm trying to keep better on myself with different runs and I'm trying to just get my head on runs every morning, maybe four or five times a, a week, Monday, Friday, or I, I'll take Wednesday off and do Saturday as well. And I'm just trying to do different runs and beat them every week. So I change it up, I'm surviving, but I'm missing that feeling of kicking the ball about and the kind of camaraderie of a changing room spirit. When it comes to like a lot of the clubs and stuff, obviously I know a lot of clubs have uh, WhatsApp groups and stuff like that, and I've seen a lot of the trainings done via like Zoom and stuff like that, or even just catch ups. Does that help with morale then? Like when this is going on, having chats online and stuff. Yeah, well, I still keep in touch with a few of the boys because we play PlayStation together, and it's good. It's it's you've obviously got your wee not groups, your wee clicks. Not there's not really any clicks at my level, but you've got the people you contact and the people that you stay in touch with, and. It helps because you're getting a laugh with them and and you're just getting to kind of share the buzz and you're still getting to speak to them every day. And, but I do miss the kind of in the spirit training when you're tired after training, getting a laugh and hopefully it comes back soon. Yeah, fingers crossed, mate. You mentioned about the, the PlayStation there and I was just saying off air, this was something I was completely unaware of. Um, you're a bit of a, a gamer, a streamer or something like that. What What is it you do? I, I just put the stream on and put a camera in my face and start playing the game and I'm not skilled, I'm not at a top level, we spoke about some people that are very good at FIFA, very good at Call of Duty, I'm average at best but we get a laugh and you build a community and it's good for people watching as well, they come in the chat and say oh it's helping my day, it's doing this and it's good, I I want to do stuff in the media or that kind of line of work after my career, I'm guessing that's the kind of route I'll take if possible. And I believe that this stuff trains you, this stuff helps your voice, it helps your conduct and it helps you get your opinions out as well and gets your personality out there. There's a big, um, someone asked me another question because uh, David Myler is probably someone who's like the kind of poster boy for, for that currently in terms of ex-footballers. Yeah. And I think sometimes he used to get like a few jibes because he was seen as like a gamer and it was still seen as quite like a, a geeky thing, if that makes sense. Do you get like, are people becoming more used to that sort of thing? Is it becoming more I don't want to say cool, but like, like you don't get as many jibes for it anymore. I, I always watched YouTube and I never really knew about streaming and stuff. And when I started streaming, I, I seen a few of his videos as well and I thought, oh, that's quite good. I don't know if it was before I started streaming or not. I think it was maybe during the time. And I thought, wow, his videos are good. He's really professional, speaks well. Irish, obviously, I've got, a, I've got family members. My gran was Irish, so... You kind of keep a wee eye on the national team and it kind of all linked up and yeah, he, he, yeah, I'm thinking, I don't know if he's working or he's just doing videos, I, I'd use the term working loosely because I don't really know the ins and outs, but I'm guessing he's working for EA doing interviews and he's interviewing a lot of Premier League players and he's really successful, he's, it can't be under undervalued what he's doing and a lot of people look up to him when they're streaming. Yeah, you're absolutely right in terms of like when you were saying before about conduct and hosting and stuff like that. Even if you're just starting and doing it for fun, it does give you a it does give you a route into how maybe you can portray yourself in the media if that's the kind of career you want to go ahead with. You know what I mean? But but at the same time, you're still only 26, still only a young lad. But yeah, going back all the way to your childhood, right? Just to go to your to your career a little bit, as we always do with this, we'll go back as far as we can. Obviously, early days, born in Coatbridge. Uh, born and bred. What are your earliest memories of liking football? I used to play for my school teams. I used to play for a team called Dunbeth, which is probably one of the bigger ones around my area. You probably heard it. I don't know, mm-hmm. maybe, but I think it's quite a well-known team. And I just loved playing. I used to love it at the start of the season, try to get the number seven. Uh, as I grew up, obviously 32 was my number, and then you'd start to go towards nine as a striker. But I think it would have been because Henry Larson I used to go for the number seven and I just I just always loved football. I just loved used to used to love scoring goals. I just everything was just based on football and 
when you're walking about the street, you always had a ball. When you had any bit of opportunity, you'd go down the park and play football. It's really been life. And now this is probably the longest I've went without kicking a ball. But the only reason I'm understanding is because if you're staying home, you're saving lives. And that's what we've been drilled up here. Yeah. From, the, from obviously the government up here. I know it's a bit different in England, but it's always been about football for me. My life's always revolved around football. And I've never really been one that studies a lot of football games in terms of I used to always want to go out and play it rather than watch it. And I'm probably still the same, but I still watch the games. I, I like to watch Scottish football more than anything just because you've got an interest because you know the players, you know the stuff. But I like watching football as a whole. So I'm guessing from number seven in the Larson situation, you grew up as a Celtic fan from birth then? Yeah, I did. Uh, I was always a Celtic fan. Uh, I actually used to go to Mullow games before I went to Celtic games because my uncle's from New York Hill, which you'll know. Yeah, yeah. He, he And my mum and dad didn't want me to go to Celtic games, especially old firm games, but just because they thought it was maybe a bit dangerous. So I used to take my uncles on a Friday night wake up, watch wrestling in the morning, and then go, and he would get tickets off a guy who worked tomorrow. I think he was a steward or something. He must have got two tickets every week. And we went we went to quite a fair few Mother games when we were younger. And I loved it. I did. But whenever Celtic came to play Mother when I was in the Mother end, I really did have a soft spot for Celtic, which was understandable. But it was weird. I always wanted to go to Mother and finish my career in my head. But... I've came a little bit earlier and I'm happy with that. Obviously, you joined Motherwell in February, just to kind of go to, to recent stuff as it was. Obviously, the game time's been cut short by coronavirus, but how are you finding things under Robinson and Lasley? Yeah, brilliant. Obviously, they two have been brilliant. Mo Ross has been brilliant as well. And everybody hints you, the goalkeeping coach, they've all made me feel welcome. They've all helped me along. And there's a real, there's a real feel to the club. There's a a kind of workman like feel with the club, everybody's pulled in the same direction, whereas some clubs you've been at maybe it's dictated by money, dictated by power, and it's not really like that. Everybody chips in and, and goes in the same direction. Is it nice to be back home? Because I think, if I believe right, you've been out, to, I know Motherwell's Motherwell, but you know, in that kind of area close to where you're from, it's been about three or four years since you've been sort of that side yeah, of Scotland. Yeah, I was Scotland in based. Austin, which is an hour and a half away. Obviously, that was to get games and I was at Hearts for six months, which, yeah. like we said, it's been a bit bitty. I don't know, other than that, how we could describe it, but hopefully I can stay here and get a bit of consistency and, yeah, try and build on it. And I'm, I'm back home. This is my local area. It's within 10 miles of the house, maybe less, of a rough number. And, yeah, I'm just hoping that I can kind of build something and kick on. Obviously, Motherwell doing really well at the moment as well. I think we spoke to Keith Lasley about a month or so ago and he was saying that, you know, being third in this division at the moment when you do have Celtic and Rangers is a huge, huge achievement. But it's um, it doesn't feel like Motherwell are punching above their weight. It feels like they probably have got the third best side in the league, doesn't it? Yeah, when I went in, I was I was quite wary. I was thinking, well, what's going on here? Like, I thought, is it Lark? Is it this? Is it? And when I went in and seen the tempo of the trainings, I seen everybody working together, I seen the quality put together. I was thinking, right, understandably why they're third and let's kick on and try and break into the team because it's going to be hard if you're the third best team in the country. Going back to your obviously your career at the start, I think you started at, at Edwy, didn't you? Is that right? Yeah, that's the local rivals in Motherwell. Obviously they've not yeah. been in the league at the same time, but well, one of the local rivals, it's a Lanarkshire Derby as such and yeah, I started there. They were brilliant for me. They gave me the start. And then, obviously, they sold me on to Celtic after a year in the youth team and then six months in the first team. I was watching, um, obviously, it's a couple of years old now, but I was watching, obviously, the Open Goal podcast with Cy Ferry. Um, yeah. And, obviously, you didn't really have, like, an, an academy career, so to speak, like, you know, a lot of young lads do. So, what was it like learning your trade in the second division of Scotland rather than coming through an academy? And what were the benefits of it? Yeah. Uh, I was playing against men. I probably didn't have that discipline side. See this kind of schoolboy discipline that you get in a youth academy. I then went to Celtic and a couple of slaps on the wrist later, I started to understand it. I started to learn it. And I've always been that kind of my own spirit, my own kind of man. And yeah, I don't know if that's why I've got this kind of bad reputation that 
it's kind of just stuck out there because I just say it how it is and and social media on this and I think Airdrie helped me just getting thrown out of deep end and not, you don't speak back to some people men you could be threatened by your own teammates you could be threatened by our team but it was proper men it was proper it was a proper old school upbringing and it was only for a year and then six months and then when I get, went to Celtic I had to stand in line and, and do my bit and I think it kind of worked well for me I think it it kind of made me the player I was because when I went to Celtic I was nowhere near the player I left when you look at like coming through like second division in Scotland or when you get players that have loan moves from like Premier League academies to like League Two or League One, whatever it may be, a lot of them kind of, it's a cliche, but a lot of them will say like, it's different when you're playing against men whose mortgage is on the line every week that they play. And there is something about that, isn't there? Yeah, well, these payments in Scotland probably don't even add up to a mortgage at the end of the month. Yeah. But it's still something towards it and... It's a shame because obviously in England there's a lot more money, there's a lot more exposure. But for me, it was a great experience. I was getting thirty pound in my first contract with a twenty pound appearance fee, so I was just playing for the love. I wasn't playing to pay a mortgage. I wasn't getting enough to get a mortgage, but I loved every minute. And it was tough. It was really hard. And obviously, I moved on and enjoyed moving even more than I did enjoy playing because I got a move to my dream team. Which is, obviously, I think you had a few options when Celtic took you on. I know you had a trial at Liverpool. I think Rangers were chasing you as well. But how many clubs actually wanted you at that time? Well, I think we kind of knew I was going to Celtic. I went and played a trial game in the start of November, so it was the longest two months ever. It was start of November and I signed start of January, so it was like waking up every night, thinking about it. And, yeah, I think we knew. So, whenever the bids came in, I knew it was Celtic. And then I got a phone call the, the morning when we went to play a game saying, look, you're not playing today. Uh, you're going to Celtic on Monday or Friday. I can't remember. Maybe Monday. It got negotiated and then that was it. I was a Celtic player a week later. Is it mad? Like, because, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm a Sunderland fan. But is it sounds like a daft question, but do you know when you sometimes think, like, am I dreaming here? Is this actually real? Like, and I know a lot yeah. of big things came after that, but even just walking in and going, like, bloody hell. I was scared to feel my medical in case the dream moved. That's what the thoughts were in my head. Please pass a medical, please pass a medical. I was paranoid because, obviously, it was the dream team. Like, I wasn't on big money. I had to go. I went down to Matalan and bought a top that was, like, £6 the morning I signed for Celtic and just so I could look presentable. And I was just nervous. Like usually, I would just turn up in anything. But I thought, if I'm going in here into Lennox Town, I'm not turning up in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> I'm going to make sure that I've got jeans and a top on. And I think it was about six pound. I bought a top. I remember it. And uh, six pound or four pound, one of the two. And I turned up, and I got obviously I got the pen, signed the contract, and it was one of the best days of my life. I can't imagine what it must be like signing for. And I mean, we're, we're talking like, I'm talking about Sunderland, right, which is a huge club. But when you're talking Celtic, Rangers, biggest clubs in the world, I don't care what anyone says. Um, they have absolute global appeal. And if it's your boyhood club, it's not just like, it's a bit like signing for Liverpool, isn't it? Everyone knows that club. When you've actually signed it and you go back home to your flat and you sit down, like how long does that take to sink in that you're like a Celtic player? I mean, when I signed it, probably didn't realise. I probably thought, what's what's going on here? And then you go in and train. I think I must have signed on a Friday and trained on the Monday. I can't remember the events. But when I went in training, I think Fraser Foster had just signed on loan from Newcastle. Whether it was his second spell or he just came and he trained with us. I think it might be his second spell. He trained with us and then I flew to Turkey a few days later. And it was just mind-blowing. It was amazing. And... It's just something that I never, ever dreamed of. I dreamed of it, but I never dreamt it could come true. Yeah. You can pinch yourself for a moment, don't you? I went I went from Airdrie to Celtic. Usually you go from Airdrie, maybe take a small step up, smoke, and then progress. But I went from, I times my wages by 20 or whatever, to a good working salary. And it was just, that was my job from then on. 
Thing is, as well, you, you like got into football quite late as well, didn't you? I mean, like we were saying before, about a lot of players coming through academies, you were like 15, 16 when you went to Airdrie. So you're going from 15, 16 to playing for your first club to playing for one of the biggest clubs in the world within like two years and your boyhood yeah. club. Like, yeah, madness. It was uh, the day I made my debut was at Mullerwell, and I actually ran on the park and had a look back to think, I think the manager was in the stand at the time. And I thought, pinch me, I'm dreaming. Like, I know it's so cliche, but I thought, Wow, this is this is it. If you if you bury me right here, right now, then my dreams have come true. You said about uh, the manager being in the stands. I'm assuming that was Neil Lennon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How how early in in the year, uh, career do you meet Neil Lennon? Do you kind of does he in, uh, introduce you to the team sort of straight away, or do you play with like the the 18s and stuff like that first? Or are you straight in with with Lennon? Uh, I think I played in a reserve game for. I don't remember why, but I ended up one of my first weeks playing in a reserve game against Atletico Bilbao. And it took some of the first team and some of the youth team players that weren't playing at the time. And I wasn't in the team straight away. So I went over there and I think we met him there. And then after that, he don't have a lot of contact. And then when I went to train with the first team, he was, he was there, there quite a bit. Do you know how you were saying before about Larson being obviously your hero? And obviously, what a fantastic player Larson was, massively underappreciated. But with the players that were in the dressing room at the time, you still had quite a few like players that you probably watched as a kid, like in that dressing room at the time. I can't quite remember who it was, but... Yeah, Samaras. Samaras. Brown, Samaras, Brown. Uh, they two I definitely watched three, four years prior. Uh, maybe 2008-2009 I think Brown was there I don't know remember when Samara signed but I definitely watched him and then there was not really many more other than they two that I can really think of that had been there a long time but I was definitely a fan definitely kind of starstruck when I seen them but it was good they all treated me like one of the first teams straight away and that was it What's Brownie like? He's alright he's a a winner wants to win. I was only there with for like maybe a year, year and a half, but he's he's got that mentality there where he wins at all costs. You can see that from the outset, and he's a top top player. Does he? Is it true that he like just switches on sort of game mode immediately? As soon as he's on that pitch, yeah. he just can't shake that kind of mindset. Do you think that's why he's such a good captain? Yeah, he's he's incredible. He's uh, he's got a winner's mentality. He, even when you play against him now, he's face just stays like that yeah. he's stone faced and he just tries to rile everybody up and he's just led Celtic to what will be nine in a row and that's incredible people wrote him off maybe three titles ago four titles ago and he's still going and he's he's probably got to go down as one of the best Scottish players in the past 20 years if not one of the best Scottish players that have played in this league absolutely you mentioned before about your debut against Motherwell. Now we're talking about how surreal it was just signing for them, how surreal it was being on the same pitches, like your heroes and stuff like that. But your debut must have been absolutely mental because you come on the pitch, you're on the pitch two minutes, you're on the pitch five minutes and you've scored twice. Like, Yeah, it was mad. It was, I honestly believe it was meant to happen because I used to go to Motherwell as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing. It was surreal. It's hard to describe because the first goal, I just flicked it on, it went in, and then the second goal, it just teed up, and I just finished it the way I normally finish. And it kind of gave me a platform from then for people to sit up and go, he's a good player. And I don't know, it's just one of these things that I wouldn't change that. That's probably one of the most special moments in my career because what it meant to me. Was it one Yammer that put the ball in? Yeah, he he crossed it and then Ledley set me up for the next one. So That's two right. top top players. Do you even have it in your head of like how you would celebrate when you're making your debut? Because obviously, not many people score twice on their debut within five minutes for the Boyard Club. But you're sitting on the bench, you're thinking, will I get on? Will I not? Will I get two minutes here or there? You come on, you score twice. Did you even have a celebration well, in your head? I did not expect to score, so no. But I was a big fan of Drogba, so I done the kind of. Uh, the Drogba celebration, yeah. yeah, that one, in my first goal, and then it was just like a, a kind of, I think the second celebration was just like, I don't know if that was first or second, but the second one was just as if like, I'm laughing here, like, 
you can see a picture of me laughing as if what's going on here like but it was obviously amazing to look back and see it who were your closest mates at Celtic at that point? So it was, there wasn't really anybody that I was so close with, but as time went on, I was tight with Adam Matthews and James Forrest mostly. We were similar ages and kind of done more stuff together. And it was a, it was a good group we had. It was a, everybody was brilliant. Obviously, you had superstars in that dressing room, but everybody treated you the same. And it was refreshing to be honest. There was no, there was no snakes. There was no hissing. There was no bad mouth and everybody was on the same page and you could see the mentality that they had pulling the league back. I think it was 15 points at the end of the season that I played and then from then on they've just kicked on. That was the, f the first one obviously when I scored against Motherwell that was the first of the nine that's going to be given obviously it's eight just now but it's going to be put in stone that it's nine and that was the start of it and then the next year you could see that they just went on and on. Talking about uh, James Forrest, had a couple of difficult years, I think, after that, but he's, he's really blossomed. Obviously, I've gone to see him a few times for Scotland. Um, he's blossomed into one of the most important players in the national team, let alone Celtic's team. Um, could you always see he had that potential coming through? Yeah, James, he was a top player. He he came through a lot, a lot, uh, a long time before me. Yeah. But when I went in, I was just, he was the kind of one I looked up to and thought, I like him. He's a top player. I want to kind of... Obviously, Hooper was my hero, but James, he was the one that was more relatable to me coming through as he was in the first team as a young boy. and He was top. He was in training. He would terrorise people. I watched him at the new camp against Jordi Alba. I think he came on at half-time and terrorised them. And I just thought he could be whatever he wants to be. And James, he's quite unique. Well, he probably could have left. A lot of teams have probably wanted him, but he just loves it at Celtic. I think with uh, with Forrest as well, I think, obviously, I think it was during Dyla where he had probably the most difficult period. But yeah, think... Dyla, Dyla wrote him off a little bit, I think. I remember, I remember, I don't know if James A will be happy with me saying this, but I remember a few times after training, Dyla hadn't treated him well and he'd said a few bad things. And James, he's not one to event, he wouldn't have told yeah. you this. But you looked over and you saw that he was kind of upset about the words. Do you know what I mean? You could... Let you tell him about him saying this, and he just he didn't bad mouth him. Type of guy who wouldn't speak bad about anybody. Great lad, and Dyla just never managed him. That was probably Dyla's biggest mistake. Yeah, because he had a good team, but he kind of mismanaged James. He said, "I remember one of my first weeks. Uh, if James Forrest doesn't train in five days in a row or three days in a row, he doesn't play for me." And James had struggled with injuries. It's not his fault that his body had let him down a couple of times, which now Brendan Rodgers came in and fixed that. So it needed somebody, Dyla's passing the blame, but it needed somebody to come in and fix that. Brendan Rodgers done so. Maybe that's a bit harsh on James. He's done it, but you see how well he's done since then. He's, for me, the best Scottish talent that's out there now. He's unbelievable. Oh, and his days, he's ridiculously good. Um, yeah. And you he can see play anywhere. Did every week. Yeah. Play anywhere and he sees goals, he sees assists, he sees pace, he sees touch. He's unbelievable. He's been made to play right wing back sometimes and he does it. He's not a player that's going to go for a 50 50 and win headers, but that's just him. You're not going to ask David Silva to go and win headers, you're not going to go and ask Aguero to go and slide tackle somebody at the park. It's, I honestly think James he could have played anywhere he wanted to. Do you know when it comes to like, because obviously I support an English team. But I spent a lot of time in Scotland, seen a lot of Scottish players, and I've seen a lot of Scottish players come through and be really successful in the Premier League. But do you still think that the the SPL gets a bit of a bad rep in England, and people just don't think the quality is good? And you've got that all like pub team thing. But the amount of players that are coming along from the SPL, I mean, Van Dyke's the standout, but you've also got Larson going back ten years. Do you think someone like Wanyama. James Forrest, Wanyama, exactly? Wanyama got the uh, Champions League final with Tottenham. Those Joe Ledley left Celtic and played for Crystal Palace every week. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And British people want to put down England. That's just the way it is. And Van Dyke's went down and became the best player in the league. Yeah. So he came second for the Ballon d'Or and he played at Celtic. So I think that's dispelled that he can't make a jump. It feels like there's, there's bargains to be had as well because it feels like the money in England between like the Championship and maybe the Premiership, the money's gone crazy, like absolutely nuts. Whereas you can still get a really good Scottish player because of that for about like what nine, ten million. Do you think more clubs should take a chance? 
Yeah, I think so. I think there's a lot of players, but a lot of people don't want to leave Celtic. A lot of people can get a top career at Celtic rather than going to a... Why would you leave Celtic winning every week to go to a, a team that's 20th in the Premier League to yeah. then go into the Championship? Like, I know you're playing the Premier League, but do you really want to play in the Premier League for one year in the Championship for a year and just keep going up and down? Or do you want to win trophies, play against AC Milan, play against Barcelona, play against Real Madrid? I know what I'd choose. <coughs> and whether you're a blue or you're a green... When it comes to the atmosphere you can get at Ibrox and Celtic Park, it's pretty much untouchable across Europe, isn't it? Yeah, it's unbelievable. It's the best I've ever heard. Yeah, Obviously, I've not been to every stadium in the world, but sometimes when you're in Parkhead and it's a European night, you can't hear yourself speaking. That's not an understatement. You're, sometimes you'd, you'd do training and we know communication. You're not allowed to speak. We'd, we'd do five or sides. We know, we know voice. You're not allowed to say pass, move, whatever, because you'd be training for what happens in European nights and you literally couldn't speak to your mate two metres away. Talking about European nights, there's a particular one that you might remember. Um, Barcelona. You're looking through the team, right? I mean, Barcelona are not a bad side now, let's be honest. But you're looking through the team there and you've got the Messi, Iniesta, Xavi. Did you know you were going to play or even been on the bench? Yeah, the manager said to me, we're going to need you tonight in the hotel in the morning. So just be ready. We were, I think we had a lot of injuries. I think there was a lot of youth team lads on the bench and there was too many injuries for, obviously, to have three or four backups on the bench. So I think I was one of the ones, the more experienced players on the bench and he told me that you'd be going on. So I think, obviously, if everybody was fit, I probably wouldn't have got on and it would have probably went down a different route. Did you think you were going to get on the pitch or did you think it was going to be a case of if it was going to be a, de- a defensive performance, which it wasn't, or did you feel like you were going to sit back and you might get five minutes here or there? Uh, I think because you spoke to me, I had an idea I was going on, but still until you go on, you don't really believe it, do you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, who would have been the centre off that night for Barcelona? PK? Yeah, I think it was... No, he came on. It was Mascherano and somebody else. I think PK came on. But when I was on, it was obviously they two. So you come on, you're one up. What's going through your head when you get on the pitch? Hopefully we don't get beat. <laughs> and then on the no, flip... No, seriously, that... Yeah. That no, was it. Even at 2-0. Also, isn't it? 2-0, I was thinking, hopefully we don't concede <laughs> two, and then we're sound. On the flip side, what goes through your head when that ball lands to you? When the header's missed, you're clean through on goal. I can't remember it. I just thought, put it away, and then that was it. Just how you celebrate. That's what I remember. Did, how did, do you celebrate? Do you, do you remember the moment it happened? Or is it like so surreal? It's just a... I just remember it, Betty. Like, in stages. And it's one of them I can just remember running to the corner and that's about it. And the roar, I think I was talking to you off air before. I'd just moved to Glasgow at that point, a couple of months. And I was in Glasgow Green, which is, for people who don't know the area, it's what, what, 30, 40 minutes walk to Selick Park, give or take? Yeah, at least. And I could hear the roar when it went in. And I had to check my phone and be like, oh, it's gone on here. Someone scored. And the roar was that loud. Was it deafening when you were there? Or does, it, does everything go quite quiet when you do something like yeah, that? Yeah, everything went quiet. It was one of the moments that just time stands still. And, but after that, I can remember walking on the park and I just could hear everybody singing my name. And I'll never forget that. It was as if I had four people around me just shouting the same, obviously, Tony, Tony Watt in my ear. And we obviously have vibrations in the room. That's just what it would feel like. Does life change after that? No, it was just the same. People knew who I was more, but my routine stood the same. Obviously, it's different. People seeing you in the street, the way people, you'd get people in the stock. I was in the Nike a few weeks later, and you can see people peeling around and eyes on you, and it just felt uncomfortable, but it was it is what it is. You kind of need to deal with that when you're in the spotlight. Is it? Because, I mean, maybe I'm assuming here, right? But you seem like quite a sort of down-to-earth lad that certainly is not a Billy Big Bollocks, which you've sometimes been labelled at you. Does it feel quite uncomfortable? And you said before about people sort of like recognising you. Is it quite weird? Because I, I imagine for like, even nowadays, people want to speak to you about that goal. Yeah, it's, it's, now it's just, I just say the same thing as what it is. And, but before it was strange, people want to speak to you, people stop me in the street. And, but it is what it is, it's part of it. You need to be a, professional about it if people want to talk to you you can't walk by and just stick your nose up you need to be courteous and 
that's it. And you just, if you want to be successful, which obviously that's what I wanted to be, and I believe I was at Celtic because I would never have done better than that on a normal career. And I played for them not a lot of times, maybe 35, 40 times, but I got a league title, I got that memory and I moved on. I was never going to play every week and that is what it is. You need to be nice to everybody and you need to be respectful. Obviously, if somebody's cheeky at me, they won't get the time of the day, but if they're nice, then they get the time of the day. How old were you when you scored that goal? 18? 18, yeah. Do you think that, like, that's where what people really don't see with football, right? Don't get me wrong. It's, I'm sure everyone wants to do something like that. But going from you know playing for your boyhood club, scoring to your debut and people recognising you, to scoring against Barcelona and going down in folklore, and everyone wants to speak to you and you get all this attention and all this focus, and you're still 18. You're still a kid yeah. at 18. Do you think people underestimate how actually difficult that is? No. I, I dealt with my own way. That was it. And- difficult point for Celtic being in the public eye but more so obviously when it comes up that quick but that is what it is I can't complain I don't have any complaints I don't have any anything to say about it that's it I speak about the Barcelona game more than I speak about anything on podcasts and stuff like that and yeah because that's what people want to speak about and that's it and like you say it's that is what it is it's, it's something that gave me a great platform and if I had never scored that goal people wouldn't know me as much and that's fine and there's good sides, there's bad sides to that. Would people want to speak? And, like, obviously every time a game comes, Tony, you're available for an interview or whatever, if I was at St. Johnson or whatever, would people want that if I never scored that goal? Probably not, but it is what it is. It's just those positives and those negatives to do it. Going back to the characters you had in the club and stuff like that, you said you were close to, obviously, Forrest, close to Adam Matthews. Did you play with Stokesy? Yeah, played with Stokesy. Uh, What's he like? actually quite tight with Stokesy. Stokesy, Stokesy, he's just, he's a madman, but in a good way, I didn't mind him. He he kind of kept his cell to his cell. He obviously had kids, but a madman in terms of he was funny, he was what a player. One of the best first touches I've ever seen, one of the best whips I've ever seen. And yeah, he's just Stokesy, Stokesy, that is, that's all I can really say about him. He's He was a top player. Do you have any funny memories of him that you can share on a podcast? <laughs> uh, no, nothing. Stokesy, there was so many things Stokesy would yeah. do in a good in a good way. Yeah, that you just forget about it. Obviously, the stories Stokesy will tell you, and he's whatever if he speaks to you, or whatever. But there's not really any, and I wasn't really touch tight with him in terms of closeness. Obviously, James Forrest and Adam Matthews. I was probably out with a lot more but Stokes had a family at that time yeah because obviously we had Stokes at Sunderland as well and I think the stories have always followed Stokes but to be fair to him you look at his career and he's been dynamite pretty much everywhere he's been apart from probably good. Sunderland but he's a kid good player scores goals he's he's a good player he's a top player yeah when it comes to leaving Celtic I remember at the time it seemed to sort of drag on there was like a chance that you were going to leave then you didn't and then it seemed to go on longer than it needed to. Um, even though it took months before you actually left, how difficult was it making the decision to leave? Obviously, I was on loan the year before. Yeah. I wanted to go and stand on my own two feet. They waited until the last day of the window. It wasn't great because there wasn't much options there, but I went to Learson. It, it was brilliant for me. I came back and... I knew with Ronnie Dyla that he wasn't telling me the full picture, he wasn't telling me the full truth. I had an offer there from Liège to go and triple my money, to go and, and I wasn't pushing for it. I tripled my money. Uh, European football, good competition. Belgian League's probably similar, if not a little bit more global than Scotland. There's definitely more money in it in terms of there's four or five big teams that pay big money, but Probably would say a similar level, but I just I wasn't pushing for it. I just wanted to try and see if I could make it Celtic. And Ronnie Dyer was giving me mixed signals. He was saying, "Oh, I remember my first training session. I, I trained unbelievably. I thought I'm showing him." And then we travelled to Austria. I think it was Austria or Germany, one of the two. And then the next day, I wasn't even in the twenty-two man eleven v eleven. 
and I was thinking, something's up here. And then he was telling me stuff. He was lying. He, he was all right, to be fair, but he was just not telling me the full picture. He, then it just, it was strange. He said to me just before I went, he said, I like you. You've listened to everything I've told you. Because he was saying to me, like, I want you to do this, I want you to do that. And I was doing everything he said. And he said, I just want my own guy in. He said, Joe Ingberger or whatever his name was. Mm. I said, no problem. We move on. That's fine. I appreciate it. I tried to get my best. But obviously, I wasn't your cup of tea kind of thing. He was like, look, I always speak good about you. Uh, Lennox Town's always open for you to use. And I went, signed my contract at Liège. Opened the newspaper on my phone. And he said something about my work rate. And I thought, you, oh, wow, like, brilliant. Just absolutely everything you've said. It's just been the opposite. And I just felt a bit stabbed. No, stabbed in the back probably isn't the word because I wasn't close with him. But I just thought anything he says from now on, it just has no context. It's just not getting in it. And to be fair, John Collins phoned me, the assistant manager, and they said, Tony, uh, it's been a pleasure working with you the last few months. Uh, you've really worked hard to get you. Because I'm not a good runner. I'm not. I'd always been near the back. I'm 90 kilos. I'm, I'm not a long distance runner. But power stuff and that. And I didn't think John Collins was a big fan of me. I don't know why. During the time and he phoned me and he was like, look, brilliant. Your attitude's been good. It's time for you to move on. Get a fresh start. Uh, all the best. And I thought... Uh, that's the measure of the man. Like I thought, brilliant for him. He he took the time and he was genuine. Never ever said a bad word about me. Whereas Dyla probably never gave me the fair crack. I kept my mouth shut. Worked hard. Played actually a game against St Pauli, and I thought I was good. He at half time he said, "Give the ball to Tony." I was playing left wing. His team talk was, "Give the ball to Tony." And when you're playing at Celtic, when somebody's saying that to you, you're thinking. I've got half a chance here. In, in the press, I think he maybe leaked it to the press that I was leaving. I think after St Paul game, everything got wrapped up. He spoke to them in the thing and then that I was leaving and then I thought, that's my cards are marked here. Because he's saying one thing to me in the changing room and then one thing there. And then everything just pointed towards me to leave. And then I thought, do you know what? I've got, I think I had a year left of my contract with an option. Celtic were getting nearly two million I was tripping my money. I was going back to Belgium. I wasn't really wanting to move away again. But I thought, if I'm moving, now's the right time. And then I moved on and that was it. Since you've left Celtic, have you been back to um, Celtic Park as a fan? Yeah, I went and watched the three each game against Man City. I think it was three each, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah it I, was. I get blood to the exact, but I think Dembele scored two maybe and Tierney scored. I, I'm not too sure, but I remember it was three years ago, four years ago, but I've been back and I've I've been a supporter. And I, I always will back. be after my after my career I will. I went to the Barcelona game actually, I think I went and sat with a hood up up the top uh, family tier. They played Barcelona, I think Neymar, Messi and that played. I can't remember the score, but that's and I went to the Zenit game in Europe as well. That's the three times I've been back. But it's it's hard to go back obviously because you get recognised but I'll definitely go back to a fan when my career's finished. I'll always have a soft spot for Celtic. So, as it was, you went to you went to Belgium. Was yeah. as you said before, the the move happened. I think relatively late for you. But had you always planned to leave Scotland and go into Europe, or was it just like at that time no. it was the best option? No, I think after all the kind of stardom, the kind of everybody knows who you are. I just told my my surrounding people that it's time for me to move on and time for me to get away from all this and try and get my head clear because I'd never dealt with that before and that was it. I went. Obviously, I moved to a big club as well but it was a lot less profile on you, a lot less scrutiny and that was it and I enjoyed my time away but it just wasn't the correct club for me. French yeah. speaking, didn't want to speak English. I tried to speak French but I wasn't grasping the language quick enough which you don't learn a fluent language in six months. No, not at all. A team where... You, you need to be for the area to really, really settle in. But a lot of the lads were brilliant with me. A lot of the stuff were brilliant. And, and then I moved on to Charlton. Same owner, same club. But kind of a club in 
turmoil you've seen now, the stuff that's going on. Had a good six months, was having a good two months, got a phone call saying, we want to sell you. We not need the money, but they hinted towards that. I was waiting on a new contract. We had agreed before I signed that I'd take a cut. Signed there, said, if I have a good six months, we get a new contract at the table straight away. She was like, yep, 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 yep. Came here, no answer, no answer. Not, we can't agree a contract because we're trying to cut things. We'll rather sell them. He can go out and loan until January and then sell. Done that, went to Cardiff. Transfer embargo hit when I agreed a contract, agreed the fee. And then that was it. That was a, a weird year. And then I thought, okay, that's it. It's been a bit turmoil. Let's just go. Got a loan move to Blackburn and we'll settle here two months in get a Scotland cap and rip my groin off the bone and then that was it it was just like that for for a while and it's just been madness it's just after that I just wanted to calm down go back home went to Hearts and then Hearts was good Hearts wasn't the, the the right club for me at that time but I understood what Hearts was I understood what kind of club it was and I thought now it's time to go back and just settle at Charlton and I went back ready to settle and it just never worked out. Carol Robinson became the manager. Didn't really see eye to eye with him. He was kind of telling you one thing, doing the other, but he didn't need to as a manager. I understand that. He wasn't really my cup of tea. I wasn't his cup yeah. of tea. I was probably a bit too vocal for him. If something isn't right, I'll say it. It's maybe a problem of mine, but I swear, just the way I've been and just didn't work out, went to Belgium. After that, I left my contract at Charlton, went to Belgium, was enjoying it for a couple of months, broke my toe. We were winning every game, manager got sacked and Nigel Pearson came in. And I just thought, oh no. <laughs> oh no, like... Not again. Why yeah. Why's it always happened to me? <clears throat> what card thought I'd got on waiting Pearson, maybe 30 miles wasn't his cup of tea. I don't know why I thought maybe being British... He'd come in and not use me as a chaperone for the team, but try and get me a camera down because I spoke to all the boys. I was tight with the boys and obviously with a language barrier. You'd think that he would use it and it's just one of them that he never started many games. He started me one game left wing, put me in and said, that's the way I like my wingers to work. I'm a striker, bear in mind, I was running up and down like a blue arse fly. And... He was like, ah, look, and then he was slotting the other winger, saying, look, he's not working, he's not doing this. And then the next game, he puts me up front, I'm thinking, all right. And that winger played, and then he kept playing, and I was thinking, it doesn't add up here, and I just thought, wasn't getting on, wasn't even making the, I wasn't making the squads, and I was just thinking, what, what's going on here? I was one of the highest paid players at the club, obviously that's the only reason yeah. you would go to a second division team in Belgium, being totally honest, brilliant money. It was money that you wouldn't believe. You would yeah. never get it in Scotland. Top division outside Celtic and Rangers, never mind. And uh, Belgium second division, and uh, never mind one of the other team, like leagues like that, never mind League Two, sorry, Championship in Scotland. And it was just strange. It was just, and then when I left, he was sound with me, and I was just thinking, this game's confusing me. Took six months off because obviously I'd played for two clubs and St. for St. Johnson was good. Good year. Obviously it's a nice club, family club, but for me, Motherwell's a bigger club, which is normal. Closer to home and obviously after the Bulgarian adventure, I've ended up here in Bulgaria. There's not a lot to talk about because I wasn't there long enough, but again, a contract I couldn't turn down. Uh, but in January, I made a decision that from now on, money's not one bit of a factor in it. When we negotiated with Motherwell, didn't even see the figures when he put me in the manager. I said, look, he said, look, we've not got a budget. I said, look, be fair, put an offer on the table and I'll sign it. And you can ask the manager what happened in January, February, obviously. I'm mixing up January and February because the transfer window. But <laughs> ask the manager how the negotiations went. He put the contract on the table, I signed it and that was it. There was no negotiating. There was he said, "Look, this is our budget. If you do well, we'll be able to give you this next season. But for now, we can't give you that any more than this." And I said, "Look, I want to work for you. I seen the setup. I was there obviously for a. Well, I was there for three days before I signed it. I think, but 
I think he had offered me the contract within 48 hours and I think that shows you that he knows that he was probably just wanting me in to dispel the rumours about the bad attitude this and for some reason he offers me a contract within 48 hours when you've got a team with a top striker in Chris Long there you've got a few young strikers that are coming through and you're third in the league you don't need to admit the squad you yeah. didn't need to but he did because I believe he's seen what I can do and he's seen that I wasn't a bad guy and when it came to negotiating, there wasn't much to negotiate. I was ready to sign it. Do you know when you were um, going back a little bit at Blackburn, what was Paul Lambert like? Because people seem to think he's a he's a right miserable bugger, but obviously he's a Celtic legend. No, he's not miserable. He's funny. <laughs> he's he's straight. He'll just look at you and he'll be like, shit, what have I done? But he, I told this story on open goal, but I remember the first night I was there, I'd met him a couple of days before, ready to sign. And I had to do an initiation. And I stood up and I went, right, lads, my name's Tony Watt. Don't know if you'll know me, but managers brought me here to improve the squad, but hopefully you can improve me. And, like, it might be hard for me to improve. Like, just took myself down, but funny. Like, just a bit of banter and the boys were yeah. laughing. And I get a chap at the door. <coughs> a couple of minutes. Well, maybe an hour later, I'd left Grant Hanley in the hall. I know Grant for Scotland squad and stuff. And I went, who is it? Like, just sarcastically. And he was like, oh, I was like, oh, fuck. So I'm standing in a pair of boxers, shit myself because obviously he said, oh, Mark. Didn't go and put clothes on. Opened the door and Lambert just steamrolls behind me. And I'm like, ah. I'm standing there like that at, like, the, the door. He's like, you? What are you saying you're no good enough for? That's the wrong attitude. Just start in the morning. You better not have that attitude and you're a good player. So don't listen to all that. Don't talk yourself down, right? See you tomorrow. Then he went out and I was like, ah. I closed the door and I was like, ah. I'm standing in a room, some hotel in Oxford, with a pair of boxers on in the same room as Paul Lambert. If you put them again, it doesn't make sense. But I just can't believe it kind of thing. And then after that, he was brilliant with me every time. That kind of that kind of hindered me because every time I was going to start a game, he'd pull me in and the boys would be like, ah, fuck you in the manager's office again. He's <laughs> shite, he's still playing you tomorrow. You, he must think you're shite and that. Like, just, like, winding me up. He's like, ah, the manager must think you're shite, but he must need to play you kind of thing. Like, because obviously he'd pull me in and speak to me the day before yeah. a game. But it was just because he kind of cared and he was brilliant. He was, <laughs> obviously, taking away this manager now because I'm working under him. I've only been working under him for six months, but if you don't include Robinson in the last, Paul Lambert's the best manager I've ever worked under, I think. Has he got, um, I know he didn't play under him, but a lot of people say he's took a lot of stuff from uh, Martin O'Neill, who obviously has been successful pretty much everywhere he's been. I think people say that, and that's probably just the mannerisms, but when it comes to his personality, I think he takes it from himself. I think he takes the winning from himself. He actually said something once. He said, the boys up front, my series just went off, sorry. Don't know why, because I said, said something. <laughs> he said something once, and it was, uh, we were playing Brentford. I always remember it. And he went, we're playing a, I think we were playing a diamond. He's like, see they three up front? I think it was Jordi Gomez. Possibly, I don't think Danny Graham had started that game. He was like, they're the creative players up front. She used three tunts in the middle. Didn't want to swear, but. He went, you're the water carriers. You get the water, you move it from there to there, and that's it. You just do that and let them up front do the magic. And that stood with me because it was like, he was disrespecting them, but at the same time, he was telling them their job's vital. Yeah. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mate. Slagging yeah, yeah. them as I've seen, like, you are the water carriers, but you need to get the water for one side and take it to the other. Do you know what I mean? And you need your water carriers. Like, he's absolutely right. Yeah, you, you need your... It was... It was as if he was saying, like, you're a vital for me if you do that job, and that's it. And we won the game. We had 10 men, and we won the game. And I was like, that's unbelievable. This guy's a genius. And I just thought, I loved him. People probably base him now on what he's doing, what he's done, sorry, in the Premier League. But yeah. I honestly think he's a top, top manager, and I don't think he gets the credit. And I think the he'll probably end up with a top, top job again. I think he's doing well at Ipswich. I think that 
I don't know what position they're in, but they were at one point when I seen they were doing well. I always keep an eye out for him, but struggling a bit be... now. But I think it's a club much like Sunderland that's in a little bit of turmoil, to be honest. So yeah, I think after Mick McCarthy left, I think he said, "You don't know what you're going to miss when I'm gone." Kind of thing, like as if like, I've kept this club and they went down straight away. And I think he's picked up the pieces, Lambert. But I think given time, he could be a a real, real like godsend for that club. Do you know when you went to uh, Bulgaria, by the way, you touched on uh, CSK and stuff like that. Now, I don't know if this is a, maybe a controversial question to ask, but I remember, and I can't remember if it was at this ground or not, but when England played there and there was the whole racism thing that kicked off, did, did what was your experience of that kind of thing over there? Did you find it? I was it, there. Was, I was at the oh, game. Oh, Jesus. What was your thoughts? It wasn't normal. It wasn't. I never ever wanted to talk about it. I got phone calls asking from Top Sport, from, and I just didn't want to talk about it. And to be fair, the boy, those, I experienced a bit of racism towards <coughs> the boy Solomon, but it wasn't from Sessica fans that that day. It was from a team called Arda, maybe. And it, I'm losing words, but. It yeah. was unbelievable. They were one lad, one older guy was being racist towards him. And I turned around and I said, You fucking shut up. I said, You shut up, you fucking prick, whatever. And he was making monkey noises towards him. And I was like, ah, What? And then when I turned around, I went, You shut up, the prick. And he was going, Hey, fuck off, what? Fuck off, what? And I was like, What? And then he kept doing it. See, like when you turn around and confront to see if somebody's been racist, they go, ah, he yeah. just kept doing it, and I think one for me, it's not saying that Bulgaria is a racist country. It's saying there's idiots everywhere. Yeah. The, did you see the thing about Ian Wright on Twitter the other day? I did, mate. Yeah, really, you, really you can't bad. Can't turn around and say Bulgaria is a racist country. It it might be behind. It might be. It could be, but you can't turn around and say everybody is because it's not fair. Because in Scotland and England there's racism. There's idiots everywhere and it's disgusting. It's it's just absolutely mind boggling how you can be dragged up to be a racist. You're not brought up to be a racist, you're dragged up to be a racist. And I swear. And one of the coaches for that our team was like, Hey, calm down. I was like, No, fuck off. I'm saying he can't be racist that blah, blah, bleep. I was gonna yeah. say T, the C word, but I said, he can't be fucking racist. I said, that's a fucking shambles. I said, if you're sticking up for that, you can fuck off. And it was yeah, me, right. me, Viv Solomon, and I think it was, I think Graham Carey was there. I can't remember exactly, but we were okay in that guy. saying, don't fucking stick up for that. You can fuck off. And, uh, right though, isn't it? It's like, you can't, yeah. there's, there's no, you can't but stick up for that. This isn't me saying Bulgaria is racist <laughs> because it's not. It, it might have racist people in it. But so does England and Scotland. Of course it and that's does. not me saying it, but I've seen cases of racism online. Maybe not Scotland as much. I've not seen a lot, and that's not me sticking up for my country. But in England, I've seen a lot of racism. I've seen it at football grounds. I've heard it at football grounds. Well, Sterling got it, didn't he? Like weeks after it, Chelsea or something like that, when everyone was saying how bad Bulgaria was, literally weeks later. Was it, was it Sterling that got it at Chelsea? I think it was. It was someone that got it from that Chelsea I've fan. Against, I've played against that team. And I'm not naming any names because it's not fair. A black player scored against us to draw or to, to win in a derby. So you will do your research. Yeah. And he ran over in front of his fans and he was getting all that because they had racially abused him before. I was 99% certain that was it. Maybe I'm foggy, but that was in England. And it's not on. Nah. It's not. It's absolutely not on. In terms of, you know, away from that, just to kind of, because a lot of people have been to Bulgaria and loved it, not just players, like people, like visiting, it's, a, it's still yeah. a really popular holiday destination. Did you have a, a good time in Bulgaria? Did Was it like lots of good aspects to it? Amazing. The malls, it was like 30 <coughs> degrees most days up until October. The malls were amazing. We ate out every night. We enjoyed ourselves and you could go to a mall and just three stories walk around them and there was a lot of stuff in Scotland. England could take a lot of stuff from Sofia as a city. It was brilliant, but it it came to a stage in January where I thought the club for me just wasn't 
where I needed to be. With the move to Motherwell, obviously, it's kind of coronavirus has put a, a bit of a stopper on all of this. Um, but what are your hopes for the future? Obviously, I, I don't know whether anything's been discussed and I don't know whether it would be right to in the current climate. But uh, what are your hopes sort of personally for your future? Because you're still only 26. You've still got plenty I left want, in you. I want a few hat-trick balls now. I've not had one. I've had a few <laughs> uh, juices. But I want a few hat-trick balls this season and next season and the season after. And then we'll take it from there. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, final question. You've played with some absolutely cracking players, um, even though, like I say, you're still only 26. What would be your all-time five-a-side that you've played with? <sighs> In goals, I'm going to go for Trevor Carson because it would have been Fraser Foster and he's the best shot stopper I've ever played with. Played with Nick Pope as well, who was unbelievable, but Trev with the ball at his feet is unbelievable and he's a top top guy so he'd be my he'd be my goalkeeper you could trust him you could fire it back to him he'll control it and cry for you which he'd done to me a few times when I was training I was thinking I'll press him and he cry for me and it never <laughs> registered and then he done it again and I was thinking you prick I'm thinking I'm not pressing you again so he would do it centre backs are we going six aside or five aside goalie included or Maybe give me right, six, for, yeah, because... Go for six, yeah, go on. Go on, I'll let you off. It's your, it's your two, choice, I can't stop you. <laughs> I need to put big, big Declan Gallagher in there because he's my, my Call of Duty buddy. He's yeah. my... And a good defender. Voice. He's my Call of Duty buddy. So he'd go in there alongside Joe Gomez from uh, Liverpool. I would put... David Tumble in there in the midfield just because we've got tight and I think he's going to have a top, top career. And up front would be... I've not played William Boyce. He's my other call duty buddy, so he can he can stay on the sidelines. He, if we play the girl, he'll make my team, but it would be James Forrest and... I don't know. I think we'd need to go with... I think James, he could probably play up front himself and put Wanyama in next to him. Yeah. I mean, I could have had Van Dyke, but I only maybe played one or two games with him. I could have had uh, Gary Hooper, who was a hero of mine, as I said. But I think there needs to be space for Deck and Tungo. I need to be loyal just now. They're my teammates. Uh, actually, I'll throw Boyce in there. He's my college duty teammate. So I've played with him, we'll see. So for fun, I'd go Trev, Joe Gomez, Declan Gallagher, David Tungo, Liam Boyce. James Forrest not a bad team pretty decent mm -hmm. yeah you got that's my team. thanks very much mate good chat well thanks for having me on it's been a pleasure ah, absolute pleasure mate it's not a problem um, but thank you I. Eh?